Good evening, and welcome to the Medical College of Wisconsin's community briefing regarding the COVID-19 vaccines. My name is Greg Wesley. I'm a senior vice president here at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and we're really thankful that you've joined us this evening. Our goal this evening is to bring you, the community, the most up-to-date information, the most accurate information we can regarding the COVID-19 vaccines. We also want to answer your questions as much as possible so that we can, so that you can best take care of yourself, your family, and your community. Our webinar this evening will consist of about 15 to 20 minutes of presentation, followed by 30 to 35 minutes for Q&A. I'd like to highlight that we really want your questions so that you have information that allows you to make the most informed and best choice regarding the COVID-19 vaccines. This evening, we have two hosts, Dr. John Raymond, President and CEO of the Medical College of Wisconsin, and Dr. Laura Cassidy, Professor and Director in the Division of Epidemiology here at the Medical College of Wisconsin. It is now my pleasure to turn over this evening's presentation to Dr. John Raymond. Thanks, Greg, and I want to thank all of our attendees for being here. Uh, we really appreciate your interest, and we look forward to answering your questions. If I could go to the next slide, please. Thanks. Just going to give a brief summary. These are yesterday's data, but today's look very similar. Um, in Wisconsin, we only had 1,435 new cases yesterday. And to put that in perspective, we peaked at nearly 8,000 cases per day in mid-November. In Milwaukee, we only had 146 cases. And to put that in perspective, we peaked at slightly over 1,000 in mid-November. So significantly down from where we were just about a month and a week ago. Our case positivity rate also was going down, which is favorable. We'd been running in the 30 to 35% range for the last eight weeks or so, and now we're down to 22.1% in Wisconsin, 18.4% in Milwaukee. Uh, we really want that number to be down significantly below 5%. When it's above 5%, it means that you have a lot of undiagnosed COVID-19 in your community. Switching to the right side of the slide, I wanna talk about hospitalizations. As of yesterday, we had 1,268 patients hospitalized in our state with COVID-19. And that's down all, about 1,000 from the peak that we had on November 18th at just about 2,300 patients. So also trending in the right direction, but still a very high number of hospitalizations. In southeastern Wisconsin, 581 current, currently hospitalized with COVID-19. That's down from a peak of 984 on November 16th. Our ICU census in Wisconsin is down to 272, and that's down about 60% from our peak at the middle of November. And about the same for the ICU census in Milwaukee, it's 132, down about 60% from our peak about five weeks ago. Our deaths also uh, had a very two very low days, with eight deaths in Wisconsin yesterday and today, six deaths in Milwaukee. Those also were down significantly from days where we were experiencing over 90 and in some cases over 100 deaths in Wisconsin. So again, the deaths at least appear maybe to be starting to trend downward, although the seven-day average death rate in Wisconsin has been hovering between 45 and 55 for the last four to five weeks. Weeks. And we expect deaths to lag new cases by about five weeks. Next slide, please. Thanks. So why, why are we decelerating? As you know, the rest of the country is experiencing a significant surge, especially in the Sun Belt, the East Coast, and in California. Um, we were a little bit ahead at, of the rest of the country in terms of, of the pandemic that we were experiencing in October and November. And in fact, for about a month, we were the epicenter of COVID-19 in the U.S. Uh, and we're glad that we're no longer there. So why is that? We believe people are probably being more diligent about protecting themselves. When our intensive care units were full 
and they peaked at 95% occupancy about five weeks ago. And our hospitals were at 93% occupancy. I think people took uh, the three W's more seriously. They were staying home, washing hands, wearing masks, and watching distance. There's also an idea called the low-hanging fruit hypothesis. In other words, during a surge, the most susceptible individuals get infected first, either because they're less cautious with their behavior or they're in higher risk groups. When they get sick, they're either hospitalized or quarantining, therefore sidelined and not able to transmit the disease quite as much. And then there's another idea called the network hypothesis. In other words, people, are, people that are particularly sociable, in other words, they interact with multiple different social networks, also uh, could have been infected and sidelined and therefore they block transmission from one social network to another. Uh, the slowdown is not likely to be, due, to be due from herd immunity because that only happens when you have 70 to 75% of the population who've been infected. And the highest estimates that I've seen for Wisconsin are running in the 25 to 30% range. And actually it's probably more like 15 to 20%. So this is not due to herd immunity. And it's also not due to less testing even though we have seen a trend where people are not getting tested as much when they get symptoms, the fact that our hospitals were full and we had a lot of deaths would suggest that that is not the reason for the decrease in COVID-19. Next slide, please. I wanna to switch to talk about the vaccines. Over the last 10 days, we've had tremendous, very optimistic news about two vaccines that are in development the first is a Pfizer vaccine that received emergency use authorization from the Food and Drug Administration on December 11th. And that was uh, really good news. And this vaccine is being distributed throughout Wisconsin as we speak. Um, it started to be administered in the United Kingdom the week before uh, December 11th. So we have a, about two weeks of experience with this vaccine. Moderna, using a very similar technology called RNA technology, received emergency use authorization on December 18th. And that vaccine is shipping to Wisconsin as we speak. And we hope that we'll begin administering that vaccine late this week or early next week. So really good news. I also wanna mention that no single drug company is likely to be able to meet the short-term demand for our country or our state, especially when you're talking about a new, relatively new technology that does not have an established large supply chain and manufacturing capacity, like the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. that are using relatively new technology. So we hope that multiple other vaccines will receive emergency use authorization over time, and the sooner the better. And we do know that the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine is likely to apply for emergency use authorization sometime in January and Johnson & Johnson shortly thereafter. This is important because those two vaccines are using older technology that's been around for 30 to 40 years, and there's a very substantial manufacturing capacity. So the minute that they receive emergency use authorization, they will be able to turn out hundreds of millions of doses. So stay tuned to learn more about those two vaccines. We do know that there is now a strategy and a framework that's in place to ramp up vaccinations to all Americans. And we sincerely hope that that can occur in the spring or as late as this summer, but all things have to really work out well for that to happen. Next slide, please. I wanna talk about the priority groups that are going to receive the vaccines first. So the first group has been designated as 1A by the Food and Drug Administration, and those include healthcare personnel and residents and workers in nursing homes. Now that's 21 million people in our country and about 450,000 people in Wisconsin. Now to put that into perspective in Wisconsin, we only expected to receive about 50,000 doses of the Pfizer vaccine in the first tranche, and we actually got a little bit less than that. So we, we've not received enough vaccine to vaccinate or immunize all healthcare personnel 
and people in long-term care facilities. But we do expect that to happen, especially with the Moderna vaccine coming online sometime within the next month to six weeks. After that, phase 1B, which was just established yesterday, includes frontline essential healthcare workers and people over the age of 75. And we hope that we'll be able to start vaccinating people in that category 1B, hopefully late January and at the latest by March. I'm sure people are gonna wanna know who are frontline essential workers. And that definition is being worked out, but the recommendation from the FDA is that it would be first responders like firefighters, police officers, teachers, others in education where they have to have face-to-face -face interaction with students, food and agriculture workers, grocery stores, and in some cases, some manufacturing plants like food processing plants where people are packed close together correctional facility staff, postal workers, public transport workers. That's about 49 million people. So a significantly larger number, but even between those two groups, we, we still are gonna need to be able to vaccinate between another 250,000 and 300, 250 million and 300 million people, hopefully by this summer. And then 1C would start mid-March and late March would be people 65 to 74 other essential workers, people with high risk medical conditions uh, like diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, and hopefully people in high risk neighborhoods and demographic groups, particularly black and brown people and Native Americans who also fall in high risk categories. And then after that, may and beyond the general population. Next slide, please. So will the vaccines be safe? Um, yes. I have to say that the performance of these vaccines early on has been spectacular, both in terms of the effectiveness of the vaccines and their safe and their safety. They really are safe. And one of the things that we need to work really hard on is to deal with vaccine hesitancy because we're not going to be able to have a new normal that looks like the old normal until we have at least 70 to 75 percent of the population who have received the vaccines, and these are two-dose vaccines, so it will be about a month after their first injection. Um, the COVID-19 vaccines did undergo very rigorous testing, um, even though the, um, we only have a few months of experience, there were no serious adverse events during the phase three trials. Um, we also know that the vaccines have been shown to be effective for diverse ethnic groups, every adult age group over 18, and people with pre-existing conditions. However, there has not yet been comprehensive testing on pregnant women, lactating women, children, or people with autoimmune disorders. The, fo those folks would need to consult with their clinicians before they get the vaccine. We also know that a few, a small number of people that um, had the vaccine after the phase three trial, so three healthcare workers in the United Kingdom, and three in Alaska developed pretty significant allergic reactions to the vaccine right away. So those were either anaphylaxis with high heart rate, low blood pressure, difficulty breathing, or a rash. That happened both in Alaska and the UK. These are relatively easily treated. Uh, people uh, were hospitalized for observation, but they received epinephrine, steroids, and uh, Benadryl, which is standard treatment. And I can tell you that um, I give intravenous iron in the dialysis unit as a nephrologist, and we're always ready to treat an anaphylactic reaction, relatively easy to treat. So one, one caution that I would have is anyone with a significant allergy, uh, if you consult with your healthcare provider and decide to get the vaccine, probably should wait 15 minutes at the site and make sure that the site is stocked with epinephrine, steroids, and, uh, and Benadryl. But I wanna reassure you that everyone is taking the safety of these vaccines very seriously. Next slide, please. Now, what do you expect if you'll get the vaccine? Very, very much like getting the flu vaccine. The shots given in the upper arm and the Pfizer and the Moderna are vaccines are two dose vaccines and you'll have to get the second dose either three or four weeks later. And it's really important that you get the second dose because that increases your protection from 50% to 95%. 
Now, after getting the vaccine, you're, you're gonna have an immune response. So that could in, include some soreness and tenderness at the injection site, redness and swelling there. Also fever, fatigue, muscle aches, joint pains, headache and nausea. These are common signs that the vaccine is working and that your body is starting to develop immunity. These typically last for about a day, two at the latest, but they are pretty significant and people may not feel like going to work. So please be prepared for those. So it would be like getting a pretty strong reaction to the flu shot. Um, it'll take several weeks for the vaccine to work and you reach your peak immunity about five weeks after the second dose, but you, you get that 95% protect, protection just a week after the second dose. And we want to encourage everybody until the entire population has reached herd immunity, in other words, 70 to 75% of people getting the vaccine, we're still going to need to wear masks, to socially distance, and to limit the interactions outside of the home until we know that we have herd immunity. Next slide, please. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Cassidy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raymond. We're often asked, um, what sort of information do we need to provide when we come to get the vaccine and how is it tracked? So when you show up for your vaccination appointment, you'll complete a brief health status form. There's about 10 questions that ask if you have a pre-existing condition, if you've had COVID-19 within the past three months, if you're planning on becoming pregnant or if you are pregnant, if you have allergies. And so this is to ensure that you are um, ready for the vaccine. And then after they give you the vaccination, they will give you a um, small card. It's a CDC card that you keep in your wallet that's a vaccination record. And I have a picture of that down on the left-hand side of the screen. It's just a simple card. We use these for international immunizations as well when you travel. And so you can keep that in your wallet and it has the um, type of vaccine you received, the lot number, the date, and the location. So they'll fill it in for the first dose and then you'll know when to come back from the second dose and they'll fill in when you get the second dose because you need to go back to the same place and you need to get the same type of vaccine. And so this is important because then you'll have your record handy. They will also upload the immunization file to uh, local state immunization systems for tracking. And this is really important because this is how we track flu vaccinations, childhood vaccinations, and um, look at disease across the state. So for example, if um, we analyze the data and we see that there's a certain geographic area that has high rates of COVID-19 positive tests, but low rates of immunizations, then we can target our efforts to bring immunizations into that community and to work to help provide the immunizations to people in those community to protect them. There's also another system created by the CDC called vSafe, and it's a smartphone, you know, your iPhone app, where um, there's text messaging capability and web, survey, say, bleh, web surveys and you could do check-ins after you receive the vaccination. So you can opt in to do that. It's completely optional, but it does have some benefits. If you do sign up for it, then if you feel any side effects or symptoms from the vaccine, then you can upload it and let the CDC know what you're feeling. So this helps us to continuously improve our efforts and to monitor how people are reacting to the vaccine. And it'll also remind you when it's time for your second dose. So that could come in really handy too. And there's access to information in there. So it's optional, but it, it's something we recommend and I think is very helpful. And all of your information will be kept confidential and private within that system. Next slide, please. The goal of vaccinations is really to achieve herd immunity. And I know we hear about it all the time, but I just want to talk a little bit about it so it's not confused with um, if enough people get vaccinated, it means you get become immune through them. That's not really the case. It's more community protection. So when we first learned about COVID, it was a new virus. None of us had been exposed to it. None of us had built up immunity to it. So everybody was susceptible. So it traveled quickly from person to person, community to community and across the globe. And that's how it became a pandemic when it's a disease that spread throughout every country in the world. And this left many people sick and hospitalized. 
So to, in order to achieve community protection, we want to vaccinate as many people as possible. And that's where we talk about the 70%. Our goal is 70%. If a lot of people are vaccinated, the virus has nowhere to go because people move it. So in that case, we're protecting people who haven't yet been vaccinated. Now, the you shouldn't really try the strategy of waiting for herd immunity and then thinking, okay, if enough people are vaccinated, I don't need to get vaccinated because you will still be at risk of catching the virus and you will still be at risk of spreading it. So we wanna reach that goal to protect people, but um, ultimately we would like everybody to protect themselves as well. And um, recently people who have been surveyed are reporting uh, a higher number of people who are willing to get the vaccine and we may be able to get to that rate, which is really encouraging. Next slide, please. So we know that people who get the vaccine are less likely to get sick from COVID-19 and the small number of people who do get sick will be mild, it'll be mild illness. So our first goal in this battle is to prevent severe illness, to protect the people who are most vulnerable to bad outcomes and to prevent hospitalizations and death. And this is a really exciting time because now we have the tool to do that. We're ready for that, but we're still learning. So we know it's safe and we know it reduces severe disease. And so that is really good, but we're still studying how long that immunity lasts. And if we need to have a yearly booster or a yearly vaccine like the few, flu. Some immunizations last for years, some last a lifetime, but like with the flu, we go generally for a flu shot every year. And that might be the case with this. So we're still studying that. We're still studying whether the vaccine prevents people from spreading the virus. Now, with um, our experience with most vaccines, it does. In general, when you build up immunity through vaccination, you don't develop virus and you don't, if, even if you get mildly ill, you may not get sick enough to spread it. So, but we're still trying to figure that out. We also don't know um, how long people who have been ill with COVID, how long their immunity lasts. But we do know that immunity is stronger with vaccines than it is if you just recover from um, the, the illness. So those are the things we know. And we also know that um, they're starting some clinical trials to test the vaccine on children and to make sure it's safe for children. So we're still working on all that. And that's one of the most important reasons we need to still wear a mask, watch our distance and wash our hands. Next slide, please. <clears throat> And with the pandemic, there's a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety, a lot of mistrust, a lot of information. There's a lot of information being shared. And sometimes it um, is misinterpreted or as it passes from person to person, it morphs into myths. So we just wanted to really give you some facts, some facts that we know, and this should help um, people if, if it's very clear. COVID-19 COVID vaccines, they do not give you COVID, I can't say COVID-19, nor do they give you the flu. They do not make you sick. There's no live virus in there. Now, as Dr. Raymond mentioned, you may have some symptoms. You may have some soreness in your arm. You may run a fever for a day or two or have chills or body aches or headaches, but that's your body fighting. That's your body building the immunity. And so that's okay, but they're not gonna make you sick. Vaccines do not contain toxic ingredients or anything poisonous. There are some substances in there that help to preserve it or hold it together, but, but they're not poisonous. Another concern is pork gelatin in some of those preservatives or things that are in the vaccine. And the Moderna, Pfizer and AstraZeneca vaccines have all confirmed that they do not contain pork gelatin. And this is especially important for individuals who do not consume pork due to their religion. So it is okay in that regard. And we do know that vaccine induced immunity is safer and healthier than natural immunity. So when you get the vaccine, what it's doing is it's teaching your body to recognize that the virus has entered your system and it says attack and kill it. And with natural immunity, if you get sick with the virus, your body has to get sick first and you have to suffer before you build that immunity and the immunity may not be as strong. So it's best just to be um, on the offense instead of the defense. 
The vaccine will not alter your DNA, and none of the vaccines with, were created with, nor do they require the use of fetal cell cultures in the production process. So these are just a few of the common um, myths out there that we wanted to clarify. And moving forward, this is a really interesting time in our history. It's an exciting time. There's people like me who are so eager to get the vaccine, but can't yet, and we just have to be patient. And then there's others who, who, you know, if you have questions, if you're scared, if you need information, we need you to ask, we need you to find a trusted health professional to talk to. Next slide, please. And then finally, just a list of some resources. We'll be sharing this information, but if, if you want to do your own research and look at some websites, these are some trusted resources. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cassidy. We're gonna now turn to questions uh, for the evening. First question is for Dr. Raymond. It has been widely reported about a new strain of the virus. Is this strain more contagious and or more lethal? What does it mean for the vaccine? Yeah, thank you, Greg. There, there are reports out of the southern part of England that, that uh, we started to hear about last week that there may be a mutation in the coronavirus that makes it 70% more contagious. That's what Boris Johnson said. Uh, it certainly seems possible. It is the predominant strain, uh, but it, it does not appear to make the disease any more severe or more lethal. And this isn't that different. Early in the pandemic, we heard about a mutation that started in Italy and then came to the US called D614G. And it does appear that it's slightly, it spreads slightly easy, more easily. Um, than, than some of the other strains, but it's it's not more severe. So I think what this highlights is we need to wear masks, socially distance, wash our hands, and protect ourselves uh, because the the virus really wants to be able to infect us, and it mutates slower than the the flu virus does, but it is mutating, and it's mutating in the spike protein which the virus uses to attack human cells. Um, I also want to if, add a, answer a question that I'm going to anticipate. Because the virus is mutating there, does that mean that the vaccines won't work? And the answer is no. The vaccines will work. Um, these are minor mutations that change maybe one, one piece of the protein, but they should still work. Okay, great. Thank you. Appears to be a question for either Dr. Cassidy uh, or you. Uh, will you be getting the back, uh, will you be vaccinated uh, when it's available to you is the question. Yes, Dr. Cassidy said she already was planning to, and I certainly am. You know, I'll wait my turn uh, whenever my category's up, but I'm very, very eager to be vaccinated. Okay. Yeah, I am too, and my husband is a frontline health worker at Children's Hospital, and he got his vaccination yesterday. So I've been following him around, monitoring him and driving him crazy, and he's fine. That's great to know. Dr. Raymond, a uh, question for you. It says, if I've already had COVID, should I still get the vaccine? Yeah, the current recommendation is that you should get the vaccine. Um, there's the, an idea that you may want to wait three months. Uh, further guidance may come out. But as Dr. Cassidy said, the immunity that you get from the vaccine actually is stronger than the immunity that you get from an infection. And in fact, there are people who have gotten a second infection. So the, you know, the short answer is yes, they should get the vaccine, but some are recommending that you wait three months after the infection before you do. Okay, Here, here's a follow-up question to that. Can I still get COVID even if I get the vaccine? In other words, am I truly immune if I'm vaccinated or does it just reduce the severity of the virus? Yes, you can still get infected. There's there's no perfect immunity. Um, and Dr. Cassidy had mentioned that earlier in the talk, but the chance of you getting symptomatic goes down by 95%. And very few people that receive the vaccine out of the phase three trials, that, that was 15,000 in the Moderna study and about 22,000 in the Pfizer study. Uh, very few people ended up in the hospital. Uh, so it, it does provide protection significant protection. That's good to know. So I'm going to, this is a two-part question, Dr. Raymond, and then Dr. Cassidy, the next question is for you. Uh, is it possible to transmit COVID if, even if I get the vaccine? 
And then how long after the vaccination am I protected, assuming you are vaccinated? Yeah, great question. Um, yes, you can transmit COVID if you get the vaccine, especially if you get COVID, um, that's possible. But the studies to measure transmission from one person to another have not been completed yet. So when Dr. Cassidy said earlier in the talk that we believe that it will stop transmission, we don't know that for sure. Um, and those studies are ongoing right now. All we know is it protects you. Okay. Dr. Cassidy, a question for you here is, is there a list of potentially allergy-inducing ingredients that people can check before getting a vaccine to avoid a serious reaction? Well, I know with the um, when you get the vaccine, they give you a handout and it has information before you do it. And so it lists every ingredient in the vaccine. And I would also recommend you talk to your doctor. Okay. Next question is for you, Dr. Cassidy. Is it true that a body's natural built immunity may not be as good as immunity built by vaccines? If so, why is that? I think I'll give this one to you, Dr. Raymond. <laughs> well, Dr. Cassie, I, I think if I understood the question correctly, is will the vaccine give you stronger immunity? And the short answer is yes, that we control the dose of the antigen that you get for the immune response, and then you get a booster dose three weeks or a month later. Um, the simple answer about why, again, is that you control the dose of the antigen and you aren't weakened by getting a vaccine like you are by getting sick with COVID-19. So your immune response can focus entirely on trying to prevent that next infection instead of fighting off the first infection. Okay, here's a question uh, that says, has Freighter and MCW received the Moderna vaccine? Uh, how many doses are in your health network uh, and um, this week currently, and how many are expected in the coming weeks? Now, that, that may be a difficult question to answer, but I want to make sure that I put it out there. Um, children's received vaccine mid, mid last week and started to administer it. Freighter received vaccines Friday and have vaccinated um, a pretty significant number of frontline healthcare providers. And MCW um, did receive our allotment of vaccine today. I actually don't know how much we received and we've been advised not to say um, that, believe it or not, the va vaccines are delivered with a police ex escort and there's concern that people may actually steal them. Um, so for now, we're, we're really not saying. We had, <clears throat> there, but to get back to the Moderna, um, to, to the best of my knowledge, we have no Moderna vaccines ready for distribution in Wisconsin. These are all Pfizer, and we were promised 49,000 uh, doses, and we received somewhat less than that, maybe 30% less as a state. Okay. Dr. Cassidy, question for you. What are the priorities for those who will be able to get the vaccine? Who's determining it? How many... Uh, community, frontline workers, medical personnel, first responders, uh, first responders, African-American, Latinx, elderly, immunocompromised, et cetera, currently sit in the prioritization. Yeah, so Dr. Raymond, I think gave a good summary of the prioritization and the timeline. Um, the way the vaccines are distributed, it's a, it's a multi-tiered approach where the state gets a certain allotment and then the state health department works to determine where the hubs are. So for the Pfizer vaccine, we have eight hubs across the state because it has to have the um, special freezers to store it. And so they're distributed there and then each hub will distribute them to their communities. And so this is to make sure we get the rural populations as well. And so the state is laying out the plan for how they're rolled out. And then they work with the HERC regions, and then they work with the local health departments and hospital systems. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty complicated um, but thorough um, distribution plan. And um, Dr. Raymond mentioned which groups were now prioritized as frontline essential workers, which was confusing before. 
And um, you know that group does include first responders, teachers, daycare, corrections officers, U.S. postal workers, public transit workers, um, food supply, store employees. And when it comes to race and ethnicity, we know that the Latinx population has suffered the highest burden of disease and that the black population has suffered the most hospitalizations and deaths. So I don't know that they'll prioritize based on race or ethnicity. However, one of the reasons they've had higher rates is because of the occupations. There are a lot of our frontline essential workers who are just essential to the fabric of our community. We cannot move forward without them in their professions. So that makes them more at risk of getting it. And that we know that social determinants of health drive some of the illness in our African-American population. So therefore those with com comorbidities or high risk um, health conditions in those categories will be prioritized. Okay. Mike, if I could just make a clarification. Absolutely. The HERC regions are healthcare emergency readiness coalition regions. There are seven in the state. And here in southeastern Wisconsin, we're in region seven. Thank you. Okay. So this is a, a question that's uh, around the issue of, of equitable distribution of the vaccine. And I think you were speaking to that, Dr. Cassidy. So I'm going to uh, leave the question with you. Um, what efforts are being made to ensure equitable vaccine distribution? specifically ensuring that individuals in underserved communities who want the vaccine will have access to the vaccine? That's a great question and it is so very important. And so one of the things is that there's no cost for the vaccine. And the other is working with the local communities, grassroots organizations to identify the best way to reach these communities, how to make it easy for them to take the vaccine and get access and if there is fear or uncertainty, having people from their communities who they trust um, answer questions for them and talk to them. We also have a lot of um, um, partnerships and relationships with religious organizations who can reach their community who may not have internet access or it's really a matter of um, working with people who are trusted and making it available and providing sound information One, one more question uh, along the issues around race and ethnicity. Uh, you referenced in slide 10, I believe it was, um, uh, issues around race and ethnicity. And the question is, do you have data, race and ethnicity, ethnicity data um, regarding who intends to uh, make themselves available for the vaccine? Well, I'll start with saying that vaccine hesitancy is more prevalent, particularly in African-American communities because of a long history of mistrust of the medical profession and establishment for, for good reasons historically. And that is gonna be difficult for us, I think, as a community. And this is one of the reasons why we're having this town hall to try to, to bring trusted voices and faces to the community and talk about what the pros and cons of getting the vaccine are. It's so important that communities of color get vaccinated because they are the most at risk right now. And really for the first time in our history, I think there was a significant amount of effort put into these early clinical trials to make sure that they included people in communities of color so that we could say with confidence the vaccine works and it's safe. Thank you. Looks like Dr. Cassidy, you're 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 pretty popular here. As uh, I don't, um, I want to present a question to you. It says, who are essential workers, and who defines the term essential workers? So I'm. Um, the CDC is defining the categories, but mm -hmm. I think the simplest way to think about it is people we can't get along without. <laughs> and people who interact for a living you have to interact with other people to do your job so this is where first responders firefighters policemen you know we cannot function as a society without them and they have to interact with other people teachers we need our teachers to be protected to teach our students we need daycare staff to take care of our children we need the postal workers to deliver our mail and um 
public transportation is essential. So, so this is the way to think about it. And you know, I, I know in the beginning of the pandemic, when businesses could stay open, there's an argument that we're all essential. Um, I've learned that I'm not very essential. <laughs> all I need is a computer. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, I'm way down on the list. Got it. Greg, if I, if I could just weigh in here, there's sort of cascading decisions. The federal government gave us guidelines. Then they delivered the vaccines to the state. The state decides where to ship the vaccines and who, who will distribute them. There, there are eight hubs in Wisconsin and then they go to the employers or the clinics. So for example, here at MCW and with our partners at Freighter Children's and the Zawaki VA, we've all gotten supplies of the vaccines, but it's, it isn't enough to vaccinate all of our healthcare providers. So we went through a process internally where we worked with the health system partners to say who should get these first. So we decided people that work in the emergency department had to go first and that people that were taking care of patients who couldn't be tested, like our trauma surgeons, needed to be next. And people taking care of COVID patients needed to be next. And then people taking care of immunocompromised patients, like cancer mm -hmm. patients or transplant patients, needed to be next. And we also decided that we couldn't vaccinate an entire department, emergency department shift at the same time because if people were not feeling well, they would be out at the same time. So those are the types of decisions people make. When we have more vaccine available and we're out in the communities, we're gonna really need our local government officials to listen to people about what our community's priorities are, just in terms of who gets the vaccines first. Okay, that's, that's helpful. Sounds very similar to the process that we went through relative to testing. Um, next question is for either Dr. Cassidy or Dr. Raymond. What's the difference between the Pfizer and Moderna, Moderna vaccines uh, besides one or two shots and the storage temperature process? And will I know which, which vaccine I'm receiving? You'll know which vaccine you receive. That'll be tracked very closely. And if you start with one, you've got to get the second shot with the same one. Um, the technology is very much the same. They use messenger RNA. Um, older vaccines use DNA. And um, the real difference is the storage temperature. Uh, the Pfizer vaccine seems to be a little bit more fragile. That's why it requires ultra cold storage and transport. Um, it is thawed to room temperature before you're given the, the shot, uh, but then it has a very limited shelf life after that. The Moderna vaccine is less fragile, um, but I, I will just say when my turn is here, I would be happy taking either one. They're they're pretty much equivalent. Okay, so the question I think also Dr. Raymond, another part of that question is, uh, this person seems to think that the Moderna vaccine is only one shot. Is it one or two shots? Do we know? It's, it's two shots. Uh, the the most of the vaccines that are coming to market are going to be two shot vaccines. And that would include the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, which we expect might be on the market here in January, um, and the Novavax vaccine, which is a US company that is very close to approval for distribution in Europe. Um, the only one shot that I'm aware of is a Johnson & Johnson vaccine that we hope might be on the market in January or February. But I'm a little concerned because they started a second arm of their study where they're looking at two shots. So that tells me that maybe they aren't happy with the results they got from the one shot. Okay. Uh, here's a follow-up question around uh, the shot. It says, and I'm not gonna elevate it based on Pfizer or Moderna, because I think it would apply uh, similar to both, but Dr. Raymond or Dr. Cassidy, you can, you can clarify that. But the question is, what happens if I don't get the second shot? Is there a window of time that if I don't get the second shot, I have to start over? Yeah, I'm gonna let Dr. Cassidy answer that. Okay, so we know that after the first shot, you have about 50% protection, and you're supposed to come back in a couple of weeks and get the second shot, which would give you 95% protection. So first of all, I would be really eager to get that second shot and make it happen and not miss it. But if you do miss it, you don't have to start over. You should just get in as soon as possible and get that second booster shot. 
And the question also builds a little bit further. It says that uh, for a person who gets uh, the first shot and then they're exposed or infected before the second shot, should they still get the second shot? Will it be effective? Um, it's a really good question. What I would say is yes, but that might be a case where you would talk to your healthcare provider to see if you might want to get a COVID test first, um, a PCR test, just so that you aren't confused if you get a little bit of a fever or headache or muscle aches after that second shot. And I would add, if you do test positive for COVID and you're approaching your um, time period for your second shot, I would wait um, until you've recovered so you don't get anyone else sick. Next question is uh, for either Dr. Raymond or Dr. Cassidy. If someone has a pre-existing condition, would you still recommend them getting the vaccine? Yeah, there, there are very few pre-existing conditions that um, where you, I don't think you should get the vaccine. So right now, and I think Dr. Cassidy mentioned this earlier, that studies didn't have a lot of pregnant or lactating women or children under the age of 18. So they're doing some focus studies on that now. Um, there's also some discussion about um, autoimmune disorders and immune disorders like HIV and cancer. For the most part, for vaccines, it is a good idea to get the vaccine. It's in, in particular, if you have um, if you if you have an immune dysfunction, the the one case where you might think about it might be multiple sclerosis or other autoimmune diseases, the vaccine should probably be given under close supervision then. Okay. So this question uh, relates to, I think, uh, the, the population that participated in trials. Um, uh, the person has a question that says, would you recommend getting the vaccine if I am, one, trying to get pregnant, two, pregnant, or three, nursing a newborn? Dr. Cassidy, you want to? answer that one. Okay, and this is what I learned from you, is that the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology just put out a statement that um, encourages women to get the vaccine. You may want to check with your healthcare provider, but they're a group of um, physicians across the country who aren't, um, are in no way biased and have the most expertise on um, taking care of pregnant women. Yeah, in, in general, recommendations are to go ahead and get vaccinated with other vaccines if you're pregnant or lactating. Um, but again, this is this is one where the federal government said, check with your health care provider. Okay. And this is a, uh, another one kind of built on, uh, I think, um, populations that participated in clinical trials. The question is, how much do we know about the vaccine's risk versus efficacy for one, the elderly, versus two, children under 16? We, we don't know anything about children under 16 yet. So we'll just start there. And Dr. Okay. Cassidy, do you want to talk about the elderly? Yeah, when I read the report, they did state that um, those over 65 didn't experience as many symptoms from getting the shot as the younger group did. So the symptoms that Dr. Raymond went over, like, well, most people do get a little injection soreness, but they didn't get as um, report as many symptoms like fevers, body aches, muscle aches, chills as um, those in the younger groups. And I don't believe they had any severe events. And the benefits are similar in elderly, Dr. Cassidy? I think the benefits are greater in the elderly because they're at higher risk. So. The benefits far outweigh the risk. And the immune response is similar in younger and older older patients. So this is good, good no matter what your age is, except for kids under 16, we don't know yet. Okay. Next question is, have there been any adverse reactions to the vaccine so far? Dr. Raymond, I think you picked up on that in your presentation, so I, I'll direct the question to you. And then what can I expect in terms of monitoring for reactions when I get my vaccine? Yeah, re really good question, Greg. And I think we need to repeat this. People that carry around epinephrine pens because they either had a severe food or medication allergy need, need to take the vaccine under supervised settings. That usually means just 15 minutes. 
of observation to make sure that you don't develop a rash, shortness of breath, palpitations, um, difficulty breathing, and those can be relatively easily treated. If you do have a severe allergy, check with your doctor first. If you decide to go in, make sure that you ask at the site, do you have epinephrine? Uh, those would be the things that I would recommend. But um, even with, uh, with an anaphylactic reaction, under mm -hmm. the right supervised settings, you can safely get the vaccine. Okay. Dr. Cassidy, a uh, question for you. Will there be an official documentation for those who get the vaccine? Yes. Um, as I mentioned, you'll have a CDC vaccination card that you can carry in your wallet. You have a, a receipt from the site where you get the vaccine that tells on that page two what you've been given, what lot number, and when. And it will also be uploaded into the state registry and local registries. So there will be a lot of um, documentation and um, tracking of vaccinations. So I, I think we've answered this question, but I think it, it probably needs to be highlighted. Uh, and it can go to either Dr. Raymond or Dr. Cassidy. Uh, should the vaccinated person still practice the CDC guidelines of social distancing, hand washing, and wearing a mask? Yes. yes. Um, until at least 70 to 75 percent of our population uh, have been vaccinated, and we know that there is very little disease in the community. Okay. Both have to happen. Here's a, a, an additional follow-up question to that. Where can I go uh, to get shareable information, whether it be a website or FAQs about the vaccine, and will it be available in other languages? Yeah, I, I showed at the end on the last slide some resources that are um, reputable resources for information. And MCW, our communications team, and all our experts are putting together um, infographics and frequently asked questions and enlisting the help of the health department, the state health department, um, all, uh, multiple experts. And um, a lot of these frequently asked questions are on other websites, but we've encountered unique questions, questions that are unique to Milwaukee or Wisconsin. So we wanna be comprehensive about it. And we're working to translate them into Spanish and Hmong. Okay. Yeah, probably I probably should wanna... do it. Greg, if I, if I could, um, the 16th Street Clinic has a lot of Spanish language information and we work closely with them and the local health departments. Um, and we do have Hmong faculty members who help us translate some, but not all of the information into Hmong. Okay. Probably should do a time check. Uh, Eric, how do we look on time? We are at 6.54 right now, and we do still have a poll to do if you'd like to do it. Otherwise, we can skip that. Probably should ask just a couple of more questions here from, that have just come in. Uh, one from Paula, which says, will we start seeing a big drop in positive test results once people start getting vaccinated? Yeah, I think that'll be proportional to the number of people being vaccinated at first. And um, I think we'll see a big drop in hospitalizations um, and deaths, which is really important, but really to see overall positivity decrease in the community, it's a it's a layered approach. You know, we need the more people who are vaccinated, we believe they won't spread it, but we're still not sure. And so we need to people to really practice, you know, washing their hands, keeping their distance, wearing a mask and avoiding crowds. We need all of these strategies to really get the community rate down because it is so high right now. Okay, looks like we have just one more question, Eric, and then we can turn to, to the poll. Doctor, uh, thank you, Dr. Cassidy. Um, from Saran, it says, will the vaccines uh, being studied with the vaccines being studied, realistically, how long will these vaccines build immunity for? A few months, a year, a few weeks? Sharon, sure, that's, that's the most important question. And I think most experts believe that the immunity will be good enough to last a year, although we don't know that yet because people have only been vaccinated for a few months. 
but the re immune response is, is pretty strong. Um, we may need annual booster shots uh, because it's unlikely that COVID-19 is just going to go away. We're probably going to need to be dealing with it going into the future. And if it mutates enough in years to come, they may need to change the vaccine like we do every year for the flu based on the most prevalent strain. But my best guess is that we'll need a booster shot every year. Dr. Cassidy, what's your guess? I agree with you. <laughs> So, so Eric, uh, I think we've covered most of the questions, unless I've missed any. I don't think I have, but why don't you confirm that for me, please? I believe that there are just a couple of questions outstanding, numbers 22 and 23, uh, around eligibility and where to go to get vaccinated. Do you see those in red? I do not. So why don't we do this? Why don't we uh, pull up the poll and have people to participate in the poll? And if we have time, we can address that. All right. Uh, doctors, I see them. Uh, Mr. Wesley, should I go ahead and ask? And in the meantime, audience, do you plan to get the vaccine? Yes, no, or not sure? Um, these two questions are, how will individuals be notified that they're eligible to receive the vaccine? And where will I go to get vaccinated? Uh, uh, maybe I'll start. The public health departments are working with the health systems to try to provide that information. Um, I would not expect that information to be available until January or later uh, because we, we simply don't have the vaccines right now for the general public. Um, here at MCW, we're finding out through notifications of our eligibility and willingness to take the vaccine based on the priority areas that I had mentioned earlier. I have poll results for you with 72% voting. You have a little higher response rate than the uh, one on Friday with 88% planning to get vaccinated. That's great. That's great to hear. So with that said, I'll, I'll close out and I'll just say thank you all for your questions. Thank you to the panelists for your time and your knowledge, Dr. Raymond, Dr. Cassidy. Uh, you've been just tremendous resources for the community. Uh, and thank you for that. Um, I'll say to the audience, if we did not get to your question, uh, we'll do our best to respond directly to you uh, or provide answers on our FAQs at the following website, covid19.mcw.edu. And I wanna say again, thank you for joining us. I want you to please stay well, stay safe and happy holidays to all uh, during this difficult time. Uh, we wish you the best and we're grateful that you've spent some time with us this evening to learn more about the COVID-19 vaccine. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Cassidy.